Hey folks, it's Bert, and guess what? Two videos in one week! Now this is kind of an interim video, this isn't really like episode two. We're gonna lead into episode two next week. Right now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna answer some questions some people have sent me over the internet, uh, mainly email, obviously, uh, as to certain things that you do with mounting the chassis to the obvious roller skate, as well as just kind of going over some stuff in more detail. More detail never hurts. So. One of the emails that I got was, how do you go about mounting the actual chassis to the roller skate? And to be honest, there's 12 bolts, and I'm gonna show you exactly what they look like and where they go. So, let's take a look. So, here we have 12 bolts that are laid out in roughly the same configuration as to where they mount to the actual chassis. Now, this is the back, here's the front. There's two bolts on either side, which actually mount directly to these fingers right there down into those holes where you can see the two by four. Then you've got two right here that actually mount through two small plates. One's right here, uh, that guy right there, and another one goes through the actual square bar down into the back part of the front chassis, or the, the front subframe. There's four bolts in the chassis, one here, one here. There's another one that goes down there, and then there's the last one that's actually at, I think it's, yeah, it's the second to last one right there, that one right there. And that's where they go. And relatively simple, it'll take you about five minutes really to bolt them in, torque them down. Not a lot of, not a lot of difficulty on that. In fact, that was, uh, it was so simple. I had given myself like four hours to do it and it took 10 minutes. So I felt kind of like a dumbass. But if we move to the back of the chassis, we've got two more holes, one right there and one right there. And they go through those points we go ahead and right there and right there. And that's that's it. That's all there is to it. So uh, these are the bolts. Eximotive supplies them. They come with nice nylon locking nuts on them. They're uh, very, very, very sturdy. You don't have to worry about these things breaking. They aren't powder coated or anything, but you won't have to worry about it. But you just drop these down, bolt them up, and you're good to go. You don't have to do anything fancy with them. Lock them down. Now the biggest possible problem you may run into is actually mounting the front four bolts. And the reason for that is something I found out. The subframes are not always perfectly square. Something that happens as a car ages, its shape will change variably a couple of millimeters here and there. I found that I was able to get two on one side and only one on the other. Now the problem with that is the spacing for where the shock clears the front uh, control or the front uh, upper control arm is very, very, very tight. So you need to make sure that you have those bolts tightened down and in the whole way, which I was never able to get the last one, so I shouldn't run into the problem. But what ended up happening, and I'll go ahead and I'll show you. So what ended up happening is right here, the rings on the actual coilover ended up impacting right here, which is obviously a problem. Hopefully once I get the bolts properly mounted, all the way here and here. I won't run into that problem anymore, so we should be good. But the first time I fitted it, I had a bit of trouble with it. Some people have done some queer, weird, crazy things to get it to fit. I'm honestly not sure what I'm gonna do, so we will tackle that at a later date. But yes, this is something very, very important. Make sure you get this stuff to fit. Some people have actually gone and they've actually cut this out and then they've added a support beam that goes through here to here, it's like a hoop. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where to find that, so if anyone knows, please tell me, because I don't actually know where to find that or even what it really is. Now, moving on, obviously we are not going to have this thing ready for the first race in the Be Road Legal. So, what we're going to do is we're going to get it ready to at least drive. We'll take it to the first race, which is in roughly seven, six, seven weeks. It's at the end of May here in Pennsylvania. It should be at the Farm Show Complex, so if anyone would like to come, meet me and the rest of the team, we will all be there. Doug's got himself a new uh, a new car. John's got an upgraded, extremely dangerous Miata that is ungodly fast, and I will have this. And we'll probably be driving this around the parking lot a lot, because this is the first, that'll be like where we're kind of safe. We don't have to worry about having it not be road legal. And we can drive it around and kind of test uh, the suspension and you know dial in the, the camber and all that other that, that other kind of crap that we really have no idea what we're doing right now. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that right now, this whole thing is actually up on stilts. I had Doug over the other night and he was kind enough to help me 
set this on here, so I just need to drop it down. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run the brake lines and I'm gonna run the fuel lines. Now, I got the Eximotive Edelbrock fuel kit. And I know people are gonna be like, oh my God, it's Edelbrock. I know it's kinda like the Pep Boys or like the AutoZone stuff, but it's what they had and it's what they, you know, you spent, it's like 330 bucks, they send it out to you. You can pretty much delete all of the unnecessary crap on the engine as far as your fuel system, including this lunk of junk here, which is like your uh, charcoal canister and all that other stuff. You can get rid of all of that, along with all this unnecessary garbage here, your expansion tanks and everything. You can just junk all of that. And I actually talked to Kevin Patrick, the man who designed the Exo set, and he says, yeah, with our system, you don't really need any of that. You can go ahead and junk it. And I've heard from a lot of other people, especially Doug, that with the fuel system, it's not really all that super important necessary and you can actually get rid of it and the car will still function just fine. A lot of it is there just to make sure that, you know, everything lasts for pretty much ever. I don't understand how a lot of it works, so I'm not gonna go into detail. But I've been told by multiple sources that you don't need it and on almost every Exoset you will see, that stuff's not even there anymore. Another thing that we've got to obviously do is go ahead and delete all of the power steering crap. Now, one thing I wanted to do is I wanted to do like a proper delete where I pull open the, uh, the steering rack and I cut out all those bars and everything. I'm not gonna do that. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna unhook everything. I'm gonna relap the two pipes that go in and out of the power steering and then it'll just be a simple delete. It won't be anything super fancy. I know everything will still be strong and it'll still work. We just want to have power steering, but we don't need it. The thing only weighs 1,300 pounds. It's going to steer like a go-kart. So I'm not really all that worried about it. Now, one other thing that I will mention on a side note is that we did get new tires. And I didn't, oh God, excuse me. I didn't go over this. Now, in Pennsylvania, in order to have this thing be road legal, you need to have fender flares, which are in a box over there somewhere. So you have to have the wheels covered. Sucks. But I can say for, you know, humor's sake, it is actually kind of a, a big deal for me because we get a lot of rocks and cinders in PA and I don't want to be driving and have rocks flying off and hit me in the face, especially at the track where there's tons of bits of rubber. I don't want to get pelted all over the place with, with bits of junk. So what you have to do is you obviously you have to fit fender flares. In order to fit fender flares, you cannot use standard Miata wheels. Anything you can even get from Tire Rack that they say will work on your Miata is not gonna work. We had Avanti Storm S2s with BF Goodwrench Rivals and they were a great tire. They are phenomenal. I've experienced them in a car and the grip is unbelievable. However, it's not gonna work and I will explain why. Now here we have a sad excuse for a stock Miata wheel. I think it's a 14 by five or six. It's, it's pretty sad, it's nothing, uh, nothing fancy to write home about, but it does the job, and I was very happy with these. These are 14 by six, so you know, standard Miata wheel, very heavy, not a lot of grip. But uh, if you look on the inside, it's the offset that is your biggest problem. Now our new tires over here are JNC 15 by nines. Now the JNCs are actually something you can get from Eximotive. They're about $440 for four of them, uh, which is a great price. And it's something that they recommend. They're able to withstand a ton of torque and they're very strong. They're not like some of those XRP wheels and some of that cheap crap. They're not gonna detonate on you if you hit a hard bump. So I'm not worried at all about that because you know, I was obviously concerned about having tires and rims explode under hard turning, but I'm not worried at all. Now with these, these have a zero offset, which is an extremely hard size to come by and very unusual. Most people don't even bother using them. If you look on the inside, uh, if you look on the inside, you can notice that the sh the, uh, the actual plate here is very, very close, or very much, a lot farther inside than normal. And that's because this is obviously a zero offset rim. You are going to need a zero offset rim if you are going to use the fenders and have it be street legal in your state if you require those. PA sucks, so we need them. So, good set of JNCs with uh, tires, these are again uh, BF Goodrich Rivals, which are pretty much the best track and street tire you can get. And they're actually quite comfortable and they work well in decent bits of weather. Obviously, not uh, super cold weather because they will pretty much turn into rock. But four wheels and four tires of mounting and balancing, you're looking at like 1100 bucks, which is a hell of a steal, in my opinion. The only downside with these currently 
And we will have to look at the back of the exoset here. Now, if you look at the back wheel here, you can see right there is the new rotor and the new caliper. Now, these are much larger than the stock ones from the 99 that I had. Those are actually from a Mazda Speed Miata or just a Mazda Sport, which is one of the later ones, the Miata Sport, which is a later model. But same NB, but they went with larger brake rotors and it had a lot more stopping. Now, I know some of you, actually many of you have told me, well, you've already lightened the car by a thousand pounds almost. Why do you need better brakes? Because bigger brake rotors look cool, that's why. But unfortunately, because we've used larger brake rotors, we needed to use a 15 millimeter offset spacer. Make sure you get a hub centric spacer and use hub centric rings with whatever rims you use. That is extremely important. Otherwise you're gonna upset the torque and geometry of your tires and it could be very bad. We've also used very, very long, I think they're APR studs. They're a lot longer than the stock ones. You're gonna need those as well. If you don't end up needing uh, fenders in your state, then you can pretty much use whatever stock Miata tires you want. But if you're like PA, which again, PA kind of sucks for PennDOT regulations is what we call, it's called PennDOT. And uh, they're, they're real picky with making sure your wheels are covered. But if you have a rat rod in PA, you don't have to have like anything covered. It sucks. But again, we're going for a good looking sort of show car. I've never really had a really nice car. So this will be something obviously uh, a bit different. But yeah, that's really what we're going to go over uh, in the next episode is we're going to mount the fuel lines, which really shouldn't take more than half an hour. Uh, I still have everything sitting in a box up there on the shelf. And the rest of it is obviously going to be going over, you know, doing how you do the brakes, which you don't really need to modify the brakes at all. You don't even need to modify the brake lines. If you still have everything, you can just bolt it right up. Now I'm going to be adding a proportioning valve for the back wheels. This was something Doug had requested and his point was valid is, you know, you might want to be able to adjust the rear vat or the rear uh, braking potential, given that we we're adding such a large APR carbon fiber spoiler. It would be nice to have that adjustability if we need it. If we don't need it, that's fine. But still something to add and doesn't hurt in my opinion. If we don't need it and it becomes more of a problem, we'll just take it out and put a new pipe in. You shouldn't have to really worry about doing any brake line work. I found that the brake lines on the Mazdas, they're coated in like a rubber or a plastic and they are flexible still and more than flexible enough for you to very carefully, mind you, carefully, don't be a dumbass with it, be very careful with putting them through the, t the channel, the trans tunnel, and you should be able to reuse everything. Because when I did it, I had bought a whole bunch more uh, flares and everything and a flaring kit, and then I realized, oh, I, I, I don't need any of this. So I at least learned how to flare brake lines. Not that I'm very good at it. Anyway, so if you have any questions on the Exoset, and I'm, my arm's getting kind of tired here, so I am going to put the camera down. And all I've been doing is talking, so my head hurts. If you have any questions on your exoset build or anything of this nature send me a message i'll get back to you guys usually within a day or two sometimes if you send me an email it's usually like 30 seconds and you can get a response from me but another thing is i want to say a huge thank you to all of our patreon supporters i really do appreciate your guys' support i've never had that and it it's it's very humbling it's it's special thank you it it genuinely gives me, uh, it makes me a little um, weird because I, I don't know how to say thank you to something like that. I'm not used to people's generosity a whole lot, but thank you. That that means a lot. It really does. It sincerely does. So thank you. Bert says thank you. And I really do appreciate it. And if you'd like to become a Patreon subscriber, feel free to go to the link at uh, in the description and you can go ahead and join our Patreon team. And as always, I'm Bert from Pixel Armory. I love you all. I'll see you guys real soon. Like, favorite, subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time. And I want to do a huge shout out to Patrick O'Connor, Nico Deshe, Evan Lansinski, and Jack Allen for being our awesome Patreon subscribers. Thank you so much for your donations, guys. It really does mean a lot to us here at the channel that everyone can support us and that you guys are behind us. Thank you from the bottom of all of our hearts at here at Pixel Armory. And as always, I am Bert. Stay safe, and I'll see you guys real soon.